how are you all doing? Today is going to be a soft spoken video and it's also going to be the start of a new series. And yeah, I found this story on the Japanese interweb and it's about a group of people that went on a camping trip. So without further ado, I hope you guys are all getting cozy. If you're ready, well then, let's get started. Camp. This is a story from last year, and my writing skills aren't the best, so please only read it if you're interested. Just before summer vacation last year, my friends A and B and I were planning to go camping deep in the mountains of N Prefecture. Two exchange students who had overheard our plans asked if they could join us. We didn't know them very well and hadn't spoke to them before, but we didn't have a reason to refuse, so we agreed to it to let them come along. On the day of the trip, we took a train and then a bus to the campsite. Unfortunately, it was crowded with families and other students, so we decided to follow B's suggestion to go two kilometers further into the mountains to a spot near a flood control dam. Since we had brought all the necessary camping and barbecue equipment with us, we could set up camp anywhere. Plus, it sounded more appealing than a man-made campsite. However, we underestimated the difficulty of the hike up the mountain. We arrived at the original campsite around lunchtime, but by that time we arrived at the dam, it was already 3pm, and we were exhausted. We had to set up our tents and prepare dinner quickly before it got dark. A and I started setting up the tent and preparing the cooking stove and utensils, while B and the exchange students went off to collect the firewood. A few trips later, B and the exchange students had not returned, and it was already past 6pm. We were worried that it was getting dark and we needed to start cooking dinner, but they still hadn't come back. We soon heard voices coming from the woods. It sounded like they were arguing. A and I listened while we worked, and then B and the others returned, still arguing. There seemed to be a tense atmosphere between C and D and the exchange students. A and I tried to defuse the situation, but C and D were agitated. We decided to eat dinner and then talk to B privately in another tent. B told us that they had found a small, dilapidated shrine in a cave behind a rocky outcrop upstream while they were gathering firewood. The exchange students had ignored B's pleas to leave it alone and had opened the door. Inside, they had found a semi-translucent brownish stone that looked like amber. But as soon as B saw it, it felt an ominous feeling and begged them to shut the door and leave immediately. C and D, however, were too excited about the discovery and refused to listen to B's warning. Then B told us that he had seen an amulet attached to the door and that C had torn it off when opening the door. B tried to persuade them to put the stone back and leave the shrine alone, but C and D refused and insisted that it was their find. Later that night, I woke up to a strange noise outside the tent. I could hear footsteps pacing around the perimeter of our campsite. At first, I thought it might be someone going to the bathroom, but there was something off about it. The footsteps were going to the river or making any other noise, just pacing around the campsite. Gradually, the sound of more footsteps grew louder. There was probably at least five or six people walking around outside. I woke up A and B, and we listened to the strange footsteps in silence. Then B said, Doesn't something feel off to you? I replied, Of course, it must be because of that stone C found, right? A agreed. 
we all sensed that something wasn't right. As we tried to fall back asleep, we heard C and D starting a drinking party outside. We didn't want to be involved in their antic, so we asked them to go somewhere else to continue. A and I went back to sleep, but I had a strange feeling that something was watching us. I heard one of them mutter something about us in their native language. We were unable to muster the courage to go outside and see what was happening, so we stayed still without being able to sleep. After a while, the footsteps ceased. After a brief silence while discussing with the two of them whether I should go outside to check, I heard a tremendous scream from the neighboring tent. It was a scream that couldn't be expressed in words. I didn't know how to describe it. Startled by the scream, we were frozen in place, and following the scream, we heard the sound of something struggling and the voices of two pleading for something from the neighboring tent. Sensing that something was seriously wrong, the three of us exchanged glances and mustered up the courage to go outside the tent with flashlights in hand. When we looked outside, we were struck dumb and frozen in place. The two people from the neighboring tent were being dragged out, and they were crouched on the ground, holding their heads and screaming in their native language. What was strange was the group of about a dozen people with tattered clothes and pale faces gathered around them, silently smearing something dark on the bodies of the two foreign students. Those people in tattered clothes continued their actions for a while, but suddenly stopped and turned towards us all at once. We have no memory of what happened afterwards. When we came to our senses, it was already morning, and I, A, and B had passed out, leaning against our own tent before losing consciousness. I remember seeing the faces of the people crowding around C and D, but the three of us couldn't recall what expressions they had on their faces. Two foreign students were alive, but their appearance was strange. Their whole bodies were covered in a black liquid, making them completely black, and the black substance that had been applied to them was already dry. It had a foul smell that was so strong we couldn't get close. Anyway, we told the two of them to wash themselves in the river, and they trembled and cried as they washed their bodies and clothes. During that time, we packed up the tent and asked the two. What happened to the stone? C pointed to his backpack, and when we looked inside, there was a stone wrapped in a towel. We decided to return it and apologize. However, their reaction was severe. D said, If you're going, go by yourself. And C said, If you hadn't brought us here, None of this would have happened. It's your fault. A said, Don't be ridiculous. It's because you didn't listen to B and brought the stone that this happened, right? I added, That's right. Since you're the ones at fault, it's only natural to return the stone and apologize. C and D still insisted and stubbornly refused to return the stone, yelling at us as if they were about to attack us. Then B, who had been silently watching, said, Enough already. Let C and D do as they please. We'll go and return the stone ourselves. He said it with a disgusted tone and went alone, carrying the stone towards the upstream of the river. A and I reluctantly stopped arguing and decided to follow B. Meanwhile, C and D gathered their belongings and went back on their own. If you follow B, there was a cave, just as B had said. But something felt strange. The air here was different. Hard to put into words, but it was definitely an eerie cave. We were scared due to last night's events, but we couldn't leave it as it was, so we ventured deeper into the cave and returned to the stone to the shrine. Near the shrine, there was a torn amulet lying on the ground. We didn't know if it had 
been effective, but we thought it was better to do something rather than nothing. We used the duct tape we had brought and carefully patched up the torn amulet, trying to restore it as much as possible to its original form. We then attached it to the door of the original shrine and joined hands to apologize before heading back home. In direct terms, nothing happened to us. However, after the summer vacation ended and we went to university in September, two exchange students approached B and started a fight, blaming him, saying, It's your fault! Various other incidents indirectly occurred as well, but I will write about them another time. In conclusion, the two exchange students eventually dropped out of school and returned to their home country. Now, I don't know what happened to them afterwards. One thing I can say that it didn't end was just that. And in the end, we never found out what the shrine and the stone inside it were. By the way, when I say nothing happened in direct terms and various incidents indirectly occurred, I mean that there was no direct harm, but both A, B and I had some kind of strange and frightening experiences. As for the two exchange students, I've been hearing various things through word of mouth, but that's a long story for another day. After returning from the camping trip, Several weeks passed without anything particular happening. We worked on assignments, wrote reports, worked part-time jobs, and enjoyed peaceful days. About a month after the incident, towards the end of summer vacation. To clarify beforehand, I lived in a student-only apartment, and A and B are also residents of the same apartment. A and B visited my room in the afternoon. We played games, read manga, and relaxed. Suddenly, a resident from the lower floor came to my room. Resident. I don't know what you guys are doing, but it's noisy. Are you making a racket with loud game sounds or voices? Me. I didn't think we were playing with such high volume that the game sounds bother you, or was it our voices? Resident. No, it's not that. It's just that you guys have been walking around and making noises in the room with a large group since earlier. Me. We haven't been walking around or making any noises like that. We've been playing games quietly the whole time. Well, if it bothered you, I apologize. We'll keep it down. The resident left, but something felt strange. A and B were there, and I told them, Let's try to be quieter since we received a complaint from downstairs. After about 30 minutes, the doorbell rang again. It was the resident from the lower floor, and this time they were quite angry. Resident. Seriously, cut it out. You've been walking around, mumbling, making noises. It's annoying. I'm trying to concentrate on finishing my report. Even though we had closed the windows and kept it quite quiet, I couldn't understand why they were saying that. I didn't want to argue, so I replied, me. Yeah, my bad. I thought I was being careful, but oh well. Well, we're going, we're going out now. There shouldn't be a problem, right? First of all, this apartment is fairly new, so it shouldn't be that noisy. Since we were warned this time, we have been keeping it pretty quiet. It seemed unreasonable to me, but while thinking that, I explained the situation to A and B and suggested we go out. Looking back now, we have been making quite a bit of noise, but we never received any complaints, so maybe we should have realized something was strange at that time. It was around 2pm, for now. We decided to go to the game center or do something to kill time, so we left the apartment. We spent time going to the game center, shopping and had dinner at a family restaurant. Then the apartment management company called my cell phone. Company. This is ABC Apartment from ABC Company. Um, am I speaking with uh, Sato in Apartment 806? Me. Yes, that's me. What's the matter? Company. 
Actually, we received a complaint about noise coming from your apartment 806. Since you weren't there, we decided to give you a call. Me. Ah, I see you. I received a complaint, so I've been out the room since afternoon. I'll be more careful from now on. Here we go again, I thought to myself as I replied, feeling annoyed. Then the real estate agent said something strange. Company. When you say afternoon, what time exactly? Me. I think it was around 2 or 2.30 if I recall correctly. Company. Uh, are you sure about that? The complaint about the noise and the request to be cautious came in around 6 p.m. It was already after 8 p.m. now. I hadn't returned since then, so something was definitely off. I explained the situation to A and B, and we decided to go back home and meet up with the real estate agent in front of our apartment. When we arrived at the apartment, the real estate agent, a woman in her 30s, was waiting. It turned out that the person who made the noise complaint was indeed the resident from the apartment below, so we decided to go there first. The resident from the lower floor who came out was clearly in a bad mood. According to their story, had been quiet for a while after the initial noise, but it started getting noisy again after 5pm. They tried to warn us, but since no one came out, they called a management company. I explained that I hadn't returned since I left at that time. At first, they doubted my story, but when I showed them the receipts from shopping and the timing of having dinner at the family restaurants, they finally believed me. Company. Um, could it be a burglary? Resident. It was noisy until a while ago, so maybe the person is still here. A. Seriously? Hey, Sato, did you properly lock your door? Me. I definitely locked it, but you saw it too, right? Besides, what would someone steal from my room? B. Let's just go to your room and check. We'll find out for sure then. So it was decided that I, A, B, the real estate agent, and the resident from the lower floor would all go to my room. When we arrived at my room, the door was indeed locked, as expected. There is a possibility that a burglar may have tampered with the lock, so I opened it and locked it inside to check the situation. There didn't seem to be anything suspicious within the range visible from the entrance. All of us entered my room and examined the inside, including the bathroom unit, but as expected, there was nothing unusual. Even the juice bottle I had before leaving was still there, and there was no traces of someone entering the room. The resident from the lower floor had a puzzled expression but there were absolutely no signs of anyone being present, which made it difficult to understand. We speculated that perhaps they mistook sounds from another room for sounds from my room. While we were discussing this, we faintly heard strange noises coming from the bathroom next to the entrance. Me. What? Is it coming from the bathroom? B. There was nothing when I checked earlier real estate agent. Doesn't it smell strange to you? In order to confirm what was happening inside, I opened the door, and in an instant, an extremely foul odour, almost like a putrid smell, hit me. Holding my nose, I peered inside, and black liquid was gushing out from the bathtub strain. The source of the smell seems to be related to it, and from the depth of the drain, the strange noises Cuckoo. Cuckoo. continued to be heard. Overwhelmed by the stench, I grimaced and opened the windows wide while turning on the exhaust fan. At that moment, I realized something. Wasn't, wasn't this the smell, the same as the black liquid that was applied by C and D during the camping trip? Me. A. B. Hold on. Isn't this smell... A. Uh, you thought the same thing? B. Just a coincidence, right? As we were quietly discussing such matters, the real estate agent covering their nose and mouth with a handkerchief said, 
this might be the cause of the noise. We will have the contractors come tomorrow and we'll arrange a motel for you. Could you say stay there for one night? It would be impossible for you to stay here like this. Normally, I should have accepted this proposal, but at the time, along with the smell, the fear from that time resurfaced, and I simply didn't have the courage to spend the night alone. I told the real estate agent, I will stay in A or B's room tonight, so that's fine, and hurriedly ushered everyone out of the room, locking the door behind him. Continuing to stay in that room was out of the question, not just because of the smell, but also because I was terrified that they might come. The resident of the lower floor seemed to understand that there might have been a problem with the plumbing causing the strange noise and apologized lightly to me for the misunderstanding before leaving. The real estate agent also explained their plans for tomorrow and left. The remaining of us, I believed, had pale faces. I said, It's probably just a clogged pipe or something, right? It has nothing to do with us, right? He replied, It has nothing to do with us? C and D were the ones trying to take the stone. B said, It's just a coincidence. It can't be real. Anyway, the three of us wanted to dismiss it as a coincidence, but the smell was exactly the same and the strange noises were concerning. Perhaps because we were all frightened to spend the night alone, we decided to stay in B's room together tonight. So in B's room, we intended to stay awake until morning, but strangely, all three of us felt drowsy and decided to sleep around one o'clock. Around 3 a.m., I was awakened by B. It seemed that A was also awakened. When I asked why they woke me up, B said that they could hear a lot of voices outside the window, and it seemed like they were gradually getting closer. I strained my ears and indeed heard something. A. Aren't we being too paranoid? It's probably just people talking outside. B. No, but... What is it? B. We're on the third floor. Why can we hear voices coming from the side instead of downstairs? They had a point. It could be my imagination, but something felt eerie. Unable to go back to sleep, we decided to turn on the lights and continue playing games. A looked up towards the ceiling to turn on the lights and froze in shock. Curious about what was going on, B and I followed A's gaze. Dozen, dozens of pale faces were staring blankly at us from the ceiling. They had no bodies, only faces sticking to the ceiling. Ah! Overwhelmed by fear, we panicked and fled from B's room in our clothes. A, B and I couldn't bring ourselves to return to the room. As soon as it was daylight, we decided to go to a shrine or temple for purification, to distract ourselves from the fear. We forced ourselves to sing loudly in a karaoke box until the sun rose. Around 10am, we used our mobile phone to look up a shrine located two stations away. We decided to take the train there to have a purification ritual performed. On the train, I noticed something peculiar. The faces of those who had been staring at us were not normal human faces. It wasn't about them being pale or resembling the dead. What stood out were their eyes. The eyes of a regular person can be roughly described as... The person who wrote this diary described it as this on the screen. And then the eyes of the faces we saw were different. The horizontal line of the eye was replaced by a vertical line. I hope I can convey it properly. The eyes were aligned vertically, not horizontally. So instead of this way, it was that way. That's very creepy. In other words, they weren't human. When I later asked A and B about it, they had also noticed the same thing. A 
Upon arriving at the shrine, we explained the situation to the head priest. He had a rather dubious expression on his face, but seeing how desperate we looked, he listened attentively and performed the purification ritual for us. According to the head priest, as long as we never approached that shrine again, things should be fine. After the purification, nothing strange to happen to us. There was one more thing that unexpectedly came to mind during the ritual. The faces we all turned to simultaneously during the camping trip had the same eyes. And that's the end of our experience. Regarding the international students C and D, most of the information I heard was secondhand, but it seems like they went through a lot. The next day, received a call from the real estate agent. They had the technician inspect the pipes, but it turns out there were no issues with them. Although something had indeed flowed back, they examined the pipes in other rooms and the underground, but found nothing in the end. They decided to observe the situation for a while. Since then, there have been no incidents of water flow reversal. I like to believe that the purification ritual was effective. By the way, the cleaning company came in and thoroughly cleaned my unit bath. However, the smell didn't go away immediately. So I ended up living in the hotel provided by the real estate agent for about 10 days until the odour disappeared. It felt like a small advantage, I must say. After returning from the camping trip, I'll write about what happened to C and D based on the accounts of people who had interacted with them. Since most of it is hearsay, I can't say how accurate it is. Also, since it's mostly hearsay, it might not have much to do with the occult. When summer vacation ended and I went back to university, some friends who had some interaction with C and D approached us and told us something strange. It seems C and D had talked to their friends about the camping trip, but I have summarized it since it's long. C, D, A, B, and I went camping together. That part is correct. The problem started from there. The campsite we found a cave, and C and D were curious to see it, so they wanted to go and check it out. B, who seemed scared of the darkness, was hesitant but didn't want to be left alone so they tagged along. At the back of the cave, there was a small structure, probably the shrine, and that was it. When they tried to leave, something unexpected happened. B opened the door of the building and tried to take out the stone from inside. C and D noticed it and warned them, but their advice was ignored, leading to an argument. Upon hearing that, I mentioned that it was not true, but my friend said something suggestive and asked me to listen to the end. That night, because of the stone, A, B and I were attacked by a ghost. I witnessed them trembling and crying while apologizing. C and D gathered their courage, intervened and managed to persuade the ghost by saying they would return the stone. However, we were too terrified to go. So C and D went in our place and returned the stone before leaving. I didn't feel angry about the absurdity of it all. I wondered why that incident from that night had turned into a tale of bravery for C and D. I told my friend that the content of the story had been greatly distorted, with the major details swapping the position of A, B, C and D, and even some strange embellishments here and there. I also conveyed that A... B and I had gone through a terrible experience during the summer vacation as a result of being involved with C and D. In response, my friend just laughed as if understanding everything, saying, I thought so. By the way, that friend had considered ghost story as mere jokes until they experienced some strange phenomena themselves. According to my friend, a few days after returning from the camping trip, they started experiencing paranormal phenomena wherever they saw C and D. They would see a black mist-like figure behind them, and when they were with C and D, they would hear whispering voices. It seemed like my friend intuitively felt that C and D were the likely cause of these occurrences. Furthermore, about two weeks after hearing the story, 
Betsy and Dee began secluding themselves in C's room. Seems that their parents were wealthy, and they lived in a fairly impressive apartment, except for going down to the first floor convenience store to withdraw money or buy food, they rarely went outside. Because of this, my friends strangely found themselves agreeing, thinking. So, it was these two who caused the problem, huh? My friend doesn't know any further details and hasn't met them since then. In fact, even if my friend calls them, they don't try to go out, they don't make plans to meet, and they don't talk about the reasons for their seclusions. So, my friend doesn't know what they are currently doing. After hearing the story, I received a phone call from B in the late afternoon. According to B, C and D had been distorting the story of the camping trip and spreading it around. So both B and us were labelled as cowards, which could lead to serious misunderstanding. We tried to contact A and discuss if there was any way to clarify the misunderstanding, but we couldn't come up with a good solution. In the end, we concluded that each person would have to resolve the misunderstanding individually. Afterward, there was actually an incident that served as an opportunity to resolve some of the misunderstanding, but I skipped that part. In a nutshell, C and D went to cry to the seminar professor, and the content of their conversation was different from their previous brave tales which exposed their lies. Until that incident, a and B and I were planning to take C and D to the shrine, where we performed the purification ritual. However, after being subjected to such a frightening experience and being falsely accused, we no longer had any intention to do so. I discussed with A and B, and we decided to ignore the two international students. Two weeks after the university started, C and D finally appeared at the university. We have no intention of getting involved with them anymore, so we ignore them. However, when A and B were having a meal at the cafeteria, C and D appeared and started causing trouble. Fortunately, I was having a meal outside of the university with another friend at the time, so I managed to avoid the trouble. The following are the accounts of the two of them. While A and B were having a meal with a few other friends, C and D arrived with several other international students' friends and a few close Japanese friends. They apparently started shouted loudly, saying, It's because of you guys that we were going through such a hard time. Summarizing the accounts of the two international students, they mentioned that they received silent phone calls almost every night. A foul-smelling liquid started flowing out of their faucet. They heard loud banging on the window late at night. They were pushed from behind while waiting for the train on the platform and almost fell onto the tracks. And they were followed by those pale face individual. It seems that various incidents have been happening to them. And recently, the frequency has increased, making them reluctant to go outside. After a while of talking, C grabbed B by the collar and started punching him. Shouting, It's your fault. You're the cause. A and their friends who witnessed this restrained C. At that moment, both C and D, who had been trying to pull A and the others away, stopped moving and stared outside the window. After a short while, they screamed, ah, and ran away in terror. It seems that C and D saw something. But A, B, their friends, and C and D's companions didn't see anything and were left stunned. Staring at the direction where C and D had fled, C and D's companion couldn't do anything as C and D had ran away, so they left as well. When I heard this story from A and B, I was scared. Especially considering what happened during the summer break. But I couldn't help but think they brought it upon themselves. While they were trying to restrain C, they faintly smelled that foul, rotten odour, that smell coming from C. They speculated that C might have been smeared with something again. Since C and D are in the same seminar group, they encountered each other a few times afterwards. However, they didn't exchange any words and never had any incident like the one in the cafeteria. 
Every time the two of them met, they glared at us. After such a situation continued for a while, another incident occurred. It seemed that the two of them had gone missing, and there had been no contact for about five days. Then three days later, it was reported that the two of them were found in a muddy state, trembling in the backyard of a residential house, and were taken into police custody. When I heard they were muddy, I thought they were probably smeared with that liquid again. By the way, there was an event before their disappearance, so we imagined that something big would happen. The thing is, on the day before the two of them went missing, we saw C and D on our way back from university, and it seemed like a group of about 10 people was following them. As we continued watching their figures, one person from that group turned and looked at us. At that moment, A, B and I froze. Although he had the appearance of an ordinary salaryman, the eyes on his face were the same as the one we saw during our summer vacation. It was only for a moment, but there was no mistaking it. It was clear because it was bright outside, and it felt extremely unsettling. We don't know why C and D went missing for several days or what they were doing during that time, but after the incident, the two of them were hospitalized for a while. But their parents took them back to their home country and they dropped out of university. I don't want to think about what might be happening to them or what will happen in the future. Either way, it won't end well. Lastly, this is just my personal opinion, but in the series of incidents, there is always a foul smelling or putrid black liquid involved. Perhaps a liquid is becoming the target pursued by the creepy eyed group. I apologize for the lengthy story, but this concludes all of my experience. Since the purification ceremony, nothing has happened to us, so I believe we are safe now. Thank you very much for sticking with me throughout this journey. So, that was that story. Did you guys like that one? Um, do you also like it soft spoken or whispered? People get shocked when they hear my voice because they expect it to be higher. Maybe you expect me to speak like this. I'm an anime girl. I'm from Japan. <laughs> With a British accent and a high voice. I don't know. But yeah, I'm I ha I've got a not a bassy voice, but I my voice is pretty low, especially when speaking softly. I hope you all enjoy that story. Let me know if you want me to continue this series. I will definitely finish this episode and see you guys' reaction. And if you're into it, then I can do more. And yeah, hope you enjoyed. And yeah.